Hello Year 11, here we are again. So you've learned that development is uneven and you've learned about the consequences of uneven development. Now we're going to look at ways of trying to reduce the development gap. So that is the gap between rich and poor. So we're looking to answer this question. How can we try to improve a country's economy and the quality of life for its people? There are eight ways of doing this. You may remember some of them. Here they are. This is what we covered in lessons. You might want to pause this slide for just a moment or two to just read through those different uh, ideas there and think about what you can remember about them. Try and rack your brains. When you've done that, move on. OK, so there are eight ways to reduce the development gap. Over the course of this lesson, I want you to produce a mind map. I suggest you turn your book, you have a nice clean page of your book. In the very middle, you write um, eight ways to reduce the development gap and then you have eight branches going off it. I suggest probably doing this landscape ways would be best. As we go through the following eight slides, you're going to be expected to pause them, read the information, extract um, the, the key points, and then move on to the next strategy. In total today, there are two questions that I'd like you to submit to your teacher. They are both only worth two marks each. So in terms of actual exam questions, we're looking at about five minutes worth of work that you'll submit to your teacher. And I don't think that's unreasonable. So just two questions, both worth two marks. So here is the first strategy. Now, um, I'm not going to read through all the information on these slides. I want you to pause each slide, read through the information, extract all the key points for fair trade and then move on. So pause this now, move on when you're ready. OK, so in terms of the key points for your brainstorm, this is what you should have got down. Fair trade is an international movement and it covers some farm based products like tea, coffee, flowers, cotton. They are examples of fair trade products. You'll notice these when you're in supermarkets because they often will show the fair trade logo. The aim of fair trade is to give a fair deal and a fair price to the people that produce the goods. So, for example, the farmers. In return, however, the farmers have to farm in a way that is considered environmentally sustainable. So basically, if they farm in the right way, that's good for the environment, we will give them more money for their product and we will ensure that they get a better deal at the end of it. The consumer will pay, will pay a slightly higher price. So you may notice that when you go into the supermarket, when you've got an option of chocolate, for instance, some chocolate will be fair trade and some won't. The fair trade chocolate is often more expensive. Same with coffee. Fair trade coffee is often more expensive. But the reason why is because part of the money that you pay goes into development projects to help improve the lives of the poor. So if you've paid more money for your chocolate, a portion of that money you've paid will go to the cocoa farms where the chocolate, where the, the cocoa beans was, was grown and will work on development projects in those areas. And that might be things like building schools or improving healthcare. So it will help improve the lives of the poor. So you're actually doing a good thing. Yes, it's costing you more money, but you're actually doing a good thing for those people. And it closes the development gap because it gives a fair price to the farmer overall. So that's roughly how fair trade works. Like I say, more expensive for us, but the money, it's only a small amount of money for us and it makes a massive difference for them. So it helps close that gap. OK, there is one question to do from this. Outline one way that fair trade helps to deal with the problems of unequal development. So if I were you, I would talk a little bit about us paying a higher price and how that money helps on projects for the farmers to improve people's quality of life and therefore uh, it helps with the problem of uneven development. Have a go at that question. You should spend no more than three minutes and then move on. Three, two, one, pause. OK, the next strategy is debt relief. Again, I want you to read through this slide, extract the key parts and then move on. Three, two, one, pause. OK, so in terms of debt relief, money was borrowed from the World Bank in the 1970s by a number of countries. And the aim was that they were going to spend that money on development projects in their countries. However, by the, about around about the 2000s, we realised actually that the whole idea had failed. These countries were 
heavily in debt. They hadn't been able to pay back the loan that they had had. And um, people's quality of life in those countries hadn't really improved. One of the reasons why they struggled to pay it back was because there was a huge interest rate on it. So, for example, let's say you borrowed £100, uh, but somebody was charging you 10% on your money, then each year you'd be expected, you'd be, of that £100, if you were paying an extra 10% in terms of interest, that would be £10, wouldn't it, per year. So over the years, not only did they have the debt to pay back, but they had the debt plus the interest. And it, it, it kind of got them to a point where they were just fighting a losing battle. They couldn't pay the money back. Um, and they were then spending money trying to pay back all this debt rather than actually help people in the country. So the IMF, that's the International Monetary Fund, agreed to cancel the debt for those countries as long as the money that they saved was then spent on improving poor people's lives. So investing in schools, investing in hospitals and clinics, etc. Investing in infrastructure and business to try and improve the lives of the poor. That was the deal, that we would cancel the debt if they then spent that money on improving the lives of the poor. They also needed to be able to prove that they were dealing with corruption because many of the poorest countries in the world, one of the reasons why they're poor is because of corrupt governments. You've learned about that recently. So they had to prove that they were actually dealing with corruption issues because if they weren't, then there is no point as cancelling the debt and letting them off that money because then all the money they would save would end up in the wrong hands. So they had to prove that they were dealing with corruption. 39 HIPCs received debt relief by 2015. So that's the, um, the, 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 the world's poorest countries were receiving, um, I think that means highest income poverty countries, and they received their debt relief by 2015. Three, three countries still haven't received that debt relief, and that's because they haven't been able to prove that their governments are dealing with corruption properly. So they've not been given that money. OK, the next um, strategy is microfinance. Again, new branch on your brainstorm, read through the information, extract the key elements and then our feedback. Three, two, one, pause. OK, so microfinance means small loan. Micro means small, finance is money. So it's giving a small amount of money to people to then help them um, develop a small business. So it is a loan, they have to pay it back. But the way this works is it's a really small loan with almost well, next to no interest being put on it. So it doesn't cripple people, not like the money that was borrowed back in the 1970s, which was huge sums of money that they then struggled to pay back. So in this instance, it's a small loan um, and, and that is received by the people that need it. And it just enables them to buy something that they need for a small business idea. So, for example, let's say that you wanted to make clothes and you needed a sewing machine, you could use your 200, it's usually about 200 quid or less than, you'd use that money to buy yourself a sewing machine and um, uh, the fabric and a few things that you need, and then you could start making products. And then you would sell the products that you're making, so the t-shirts or the, uh, you know, whatever it is you're sewing, dresses, skirts, whatever, uh, you'd sell those products to people in the community, and the money that you make then goes back to paying off the loan. It's successful because it's small. It would not be successful if we were if we were lending thousands of pounds to people that physically would struggle to pay that back. If you lent somebody ten thousand pounds and they spent it all on equipment, but then they were making products that weren't really recuperating that money back, then they would be in debt for many, many years, probably to the point where they were bankrupt, especially if their business idea didn't take off. So by giving them just a small amount of money, it means that it's easy for them to pay back and they don't get bogged down in it. So it's far more successful. A nice example for your notes is um, Thinker Bank in Nigeria, which lent money for sewing machines. And that was the picture that you saw on the previous slide. 
OK, there is a question to go with this one as well. So please pause this, read through the information. Make sure that you um, refer to the source in your answers, please. Don't just copy out information, but actually say, uh, interpret it and make sure you explain what it's saying. When you've done that, submit it to your teacher and move on. OK, last few. Industrial development. Again, that's the title for your new branch. Read through the information, pick out the key points and then move on when you're ready. Three, two, one, pause. OK, so industrial development. Generally speaking, this will start with the arrival of a transnational corporation in a country. So, for example, um, Unilever is the name of a transnational corporation. So is Nike, so is Coca-Cola. They are all huge companies that operate all over the world. So let's just say that uh, some, someone like Unilever sets up in Nigeria or Coca-Cola sets up in India. They then invest in the area. So they invest in building the infrastructure, the roads, water systems, electricity systems, all the things that they need in order for their business to be able to thrive. So that's great because they're spending money making the area better. They also provide much needed jobs for, for local people, which provides people with income. They've now got wages coming in each week. Those people have got a little bit richer and they've got a little bit, bit money, a little bit of money now left over. So they start spending that money in the local economy. They start spending it in the local shops. And in time, that leads to a multiplier effect. Which means that other businesses will set up to take advantage of the fact that people have got a little bit more money uh, to spend. So therefore, before you know it, you've got a hairdresser set up and then you've got somebody selling flowers and then you've got somebody selling something else. And all these services start to set up because the people that live there have got the money to be able to spend on those services. And before you know it, all those services are offering more and more jobs and people just get wealthier and wealthier. So it's like a, a virtuous cycle of progress. Things keep getting better for people. That's what the multiplier effect really is. Then, remember, all these people that are earning, including the transnational corporation, will be paying tax to the government. So the tax goes to the government and the government can reinvest that money back into the country on further development projects, which will improve the lives of the poor. My example is Unilever in Nigeria and they employ 1,200 people, I think more than that actually, um, and Unilever uh, make all sorts of products, mostly cleaning products like soaps and shower gels. Uh, I can guarantee you've probably got Unilever products in your home. There is a downside to TNCs, and that is that they can damage the environment because of the way that they operate. So, for instance, uh, going back to the example of Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola will actually... Um, it, in order to make Coca-Cola, the drink, they have a waste product. And a lot of that waste product was ending up in nearby rivers and watercourses. And that was polluting the rivers. And then the local people that were drawing water from those rivers to use were getting poorly and becoming sick. And that was Coca-Cola's fault. Similarly, um, other businesses in Nigeria, um, like Shell, who um, uh, make oil, which we have, we have in our petrol stations, um, they have polluted the environment by having things like oils, by creating you know, accidents happen, don't they, like oil spills, um, and that can often damage the environment as well. So they can actually um, have damaging impacts on the environment and society, especially as the laws that they have to abide by are not quite as strict as they are in a country like ours. OK, last couple. Aid. Again, pause, pause this slide and create your... Uh, brainstorm. Three, two, one, pause. Okay, so aid can be short term or long term. Uh, for instance, if we've had an earthquake somewhere, then um, aid is often sent over instantly in the form of um, fresh uh, uh, water, uh, blankets, tents, etc. So that can be aid. It can be by giving products or money. Uh, and it can also be given in terms of the long term um, for helping with rebuilding projects and things like that. In the set in using the example of our earthquake. Charities generally do a very good job and they are non-governmental organisations which means that they get their money from donations um, from the general public so from you and me um, and they don't have to follow rules set out by governments. 
Because of that, it means that they can often work on a very small scale and they can directly benefit the people that absolutely need it. Usually nothing is wanted in return. So it's, you know, it really is very altruistic. People are donating money out of the love of their hearts and they don't want anything back. If aid is tied, then in that respect, something is wanted back. So it usually comes with conditions and those conditions can sometimes be detrimental to the people that they're actually trying to help. So tied aid is not as good as when it's just um, aid that, that doesn't require anything in return. Another disadvantage is that aid could stop at any time. So a charity that's working in a, in a small remote village in the middle of nowhere in, in, in an African country, they could if they wanted, let's say they were building a water, building wells, they could if they wanted just stop doing that and leave the area. However, it's very unlikely um, because the fact that they're there in the first place is because they're trying to do something to help the people. So it's very unlikely that they're just going to suddenly pull out of a contract or of an idea and um, leave the people in the lurch. So that's quite unlikely, but it could happen. The biggest worry actually is that countries get dependent on aid and instead of developing their own industries, they just continue to rely on aid. For instance, I'll give you an example. We donate a lot of clothes, don't we, to the clothing banks. And one of the problems with that is, with all those clothes going over to, um, let's just say, an African country again, uh, constantly going to an area in an African country, then the people will become reliant on the, that clothing rather than developing their own factories and making their own clothes. Um, so that's one of the worries is that they become dependent on it. Moving on, appropriate technology. Again, pause, your, pause this slide and add to your brainstorm. Three, two, one, pod. OK, appropriate technology is brilliant because it's sustainable. Basically, technology is something that makes somebody's life easier. It doesn't have to be high tech. We generally always think of technology in terms of gadgets, don't we? Phones, things that require energy, things that need plugging in, things that are very expensive. But that's because we live in a high tech society. But the word technology actually is just about designing something or making something to help somebody else's life, um, to make it just a little bit easier, to make a job slightly easier. So the idea of the rocket stove that you've just been reading about is a really simple technique which makes cooking easier. Appropriate technology is exactly that. It is a appropriate. That means for a poor person in a poor country, it needs to be affordable. It needs to be easy to use because it probably is that they don't have many qualifications or the skills to be able to use things. It needs to be easy to maintain. If it breaks, they need to be able to fix it and they need to be able to work it. So it's got to be appropriate for their level of skill and for their um, their finances, their financial situation. So in this way, appropriate technology is socially sustainable because it's good for them and it's economically sustainable because it's affordable. The rocket stove is a perfect example and it's also better for the environment. Rocket, rocket stove is a nice example for that because it burns less wood, which means that less trees have to be chopped down because it actually makes cooking more efficient. So appropriate technology is great. And people can then improve their lives which will close the development gap. And the final one is investment. Um, and investment really links to industrial development, which we've already covered. So I've not got a big slide for this, um, but investment by other nations, uh, non-governmental organisations and transnational companies, we've already talked about these, um, obviously can help improve areas a lot. So Google, Walmart, the World Bank, over 2,000 Chinese companies have all invested in Africa in large schemes such as hydroelectric power stations in order to provide energy uh, in Madagascar uh, and a railway in Sudan. So they're investing in very large projects um, which are then hopefully improving lives for the poor. So um, these companies are some of the wealthiest companies in the world, lots and lots of money, and they're able to invest in um, different projects to help better the lives for the poor. And the final one is actually tourism, but we're going to focus on this one next lesson. Um, we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail, and it's also coming up on your mock, which is why we're going to focus on it next lesson. So watch this space. So all you need to do now, please, is submit your two answers. 
there's a, uh, what they were so you, you should have done both of these questions now you just need to take photos of them and get them submitted to your teacher as soon as you can and that's it thanks for listening bye bye